American Medical Association brought to the table, the doctors, uh, they're different doctors associations, but most of them agree that for the most part, currently, um, we don't have enough incentives or reimbursements to doctors or to patients for getting preventative care that can save uh, money for everybody over time. And there are a couple of things that I think have broken down on that. this. The biggest one is this. You would think the private insurance companies would want to do the preventative medicine so that they don't get stuck with the really big bill down the road. Well, the problem is in our current economy, in America's current economy, the insurance companies don't expect you to be on their health insurance for that long. So their incentive is actually to make sure you find out you're sick when you're on someone else's insurance. So we've lost the incentive for doing the very things that we all know are cheaper to do up front, the prevention and, and the primary care. So this is an area where I think they're, that putting um, some rules into place about co-pays and prevention and screenings is one of the biggest priorities for a lot of the doctors and I think one of the places. Now, you know, one example that, that keeps coming up when I visit hospitals is the example of, of neonatal intensive care. Um, the average stay in a hospital, in a NICU unit, is 34 days. It's about $280,000, pretty close to $300,000. A prenatal visit can be as cheap as $15. Now, those babies born where the cost gets passed to us currently, under the current system, either through Medicaid or through uh, uninsured, um, a, a very substantial portion of those cases could be prevented potentially with prenatal care and prenatal visits. So this is something where you're talking about $50 versus $300,000. Now, it's not all about getting that $50 visit. There's also education, there are culture issues and other things. But clearly, screenings with cancers to catch it early and other things is one of the areas where somehow the incentive structure is broken down. Um, to uh, Sheila's questions, um, I'll start with the education question. Uh, I am very excited about advocating for not just education, but also workforce development here in Mecklenburg County and across Southern Virginia. Um, I was really excited to be part of the groundbreaking out of the new center. Um, that is going to be looking at a lot of the advanced learning opportunities uh, as well as a new why, which is great for everyone being a little healthier. The issues, as you mentioned, are we are training a new workforce for a new era. We need to be looking at making sure we've got the computer technology uh, and other things in there. But we also have seen an increasing amount of the education um, and workforce training going on the community college system. And we have amazing community colleges uh, here in Southern Virginia and throughout uh, the district, some of the best in the state. Uh, really impressive numbers. Uh, my fir the first thing I did in Congress was actually to write a $2,500 tuition tax credit that became law uh, to help make community college more affordable. Um, this was the first time that it not only included the courses but also the books and the ancillary costs because often that can be prohibitive for folks. With the dual enrollment programs that we've had, frequently not only are you getting kids learning in a very exciting environment, but you might save their parents a year or two of college because of the number of credits they come out with. If those are financial aid kids, you're also saving the state that money. So I think what we're looking at with the great education systems in these counties is, is high schools that can be integrated with the community colleges and the universities and with the global economy and training people for whether it's the data jobs or the advanced manufacturing jobs or others. And I do think we want to make uh, every kid who wants to college, get to college, have an opportunity to get there. But we also need to take seriously those who don't want to go to college or just aren't on that track and invest in vocational and skills training programs and other things uh, that can really be the difference between you know, a minimum wage job and, a, and a, a job where you can really support a family. So I think all those are important. To the question of uh, the plan, the actual plan being proposed is one that would allow you and I to both make the same decision, which is to keep the insurance we're on. This is not a system that is based on the idea of forcing everyone to change their insurance. In fact, it would be a much shorter bill if that was the goal. But it's a much harder project to actually create a system that protects people in the insurance program they're in while trying to create a market where there's a market failure, which is for those groups that currently fall under the uninsured. So under this plan, I would be able to keep my insurance. Now, if I lost my job next year, which we all know is possible in November, then I, like other people in those categories, would be able to go into this exchange to buy either from a private insurance company or possibly from a co-op or a public option. Here's, here's the way that the system is, is designed to work. Who are the groups in that category? You have five major groups in the uninsured right now. 
You have illegal immigrants we've already talked about, and really nothing's changing on that. So you've got 37 million left. And I know there are disputes over the numbers, but let's just work with this for a second. The biggest groups are people aged 50 to 64 years old who, for whatever reason, have lost their insurance and no private insurance wants to pick them up, and they're just praying they make it to Medicare. People with a pre-existing condition or a family member with a pre-existing condition. No one wants to touch them. People who are self-employed or employed in a very small business that doesn't really have any negotiating position in the open market and young people who think they're immortal or don't have a job yet or whatever and really want to push that down the line. So here you have an issue where these folks really don't have access to affordable health care. Many of them are not in poverty. We're not talk people who are in poverty for the most part are already covered on Medicaid. We're actually talking about people who can afford to pay. And it's not a system where they're getting free health care. The system is this. Right now, if an individual in that group calls the insurance company and says, I want insurance, you know, click. But if you put 30 million people together and you say to the insurance companies, why don't you compete for this business, then all of a sudden they're very, very interested. So what happens is essentially a grocery store for these groups where you can go in and any private insurance company in the country can put their product on the shelf and say, buy our product. And then there may or may not be a public option, which I'm sure we'll get into in a car co-op, also on that shelf. But the idea is for people to actually buy insurance. Now, it's potentially a win-win because people who are currently um, you know, basically dead weight on the system, that, that money is getting shifted over to, to those of us who are paying. But it also means for those people, they have the security of having insurance, which is pretty good news for them, and they're getting it at an affordable price. So that's, uh, that's the system that is being proposed here, um, rather than people being forced uh, into any particular system. To um, Debbie's point, um, the, uh, I guess a couple things. One, on the state rules, this is another one.